Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 15, 2014, and this is the week in shorts. Well, here it comes. I know I say this every week, but uh, this week I really mean it, especially given the developing situation in the markets. In fact, it's always a developing situation, but uh, this week looks pretty interesting, and um, I'm going to have a lot to talk about. So I'm going to go get a little jacked up, you tried to say, on some Mountain Dew. I did not get reimbursed for this free endorsement. The PepsiCo, if you're out there, I'll uh, I'll take it. All right, uh, there's a disclaimer screen. If you've been trading for more than a day, you probably know that you can lose money. Oh, this stuff. I'm actually bringing back the old disclaimer. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Okay, here's a part of the show where I beg for a review on Amazon.com. I'm not ashamed to ask for a review. A lot of you guys email me, tell me, you like the book? And I say, hey, could you put that up on Amazon? And sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. But I would appreciate it. Sometimes we have more people here than we have reviews, so somebody's holding out on me. And the reason I ask is because every now and then, as I say often, you get somebody who's malignant who reviews the reviews. And I can't imagine that. You would have enough time to review book reviews, but um, <laughs> it happens. I guess they're born that way and will be that way for life. All right, what we're we going to talk about? Um, I really want to talk about what we've been talking about, and I think that's real important that we continue that conversation. And I want to rehash and build upon some of these things. And right now we're going through these less than ideal conditions. The market appears to be going through a tra transition. By the way, this is the slowest transition ever, and I'm going to talk about that in a little while. And like I've been saying, it's kind of like boiling the frog. It's like, yeah, the water's okay. It's not bad. It's kind of warm. Come on in. And then the water kind of slowly heats up. And I think that's what we've been seeing, and I have never seen it unfold as slow as it has. I don't want to get too far into that. Because we're going to cover that in a lot of details in just one second. But uh, talk about the general mentality of what goes through your head, what goes through everyone else's head when the market is uh, doing these things. Um, I'll probably touch upon some of the things we talked about over the last couple of weeks, such as ebb and flow. Um, I want to talk a lot about living through the flat times. And I was got to thinking about it, and this is what separates the men from the boys. By the way, um, this profession obviously – is a male dominated one but I got to thinking about it this morning as far as the ego is concerned I think that the ego outweighs the emotions when it comes to the handling these situations like less than ideal conditions and let me tell you where I'm going with that um, it's a male dominated industry but I have to say in spite of what some hedge fund guy said recently and I forget who it was some hedge fund guy said that women make bad traders because they're too emotional. Well, I think that, at least from what I've seen, women make better traders, no offense to you guys out there, because they don't let their egos get in the way. If a stop gets hit, then they they deal with it. They exit the position. Um, in less than ideal conditions, they don't fly off and start day trading and doing something crazy. They just tend to be more patient. And if um, I don't keep all these stats and people that ask me, I don't market. I mean, I, I not that I'm saying I'm anything wrong with marketing or I never will market. I probably should market other than my newsletter and all. Um, but when I've talked to people about marketing in the past, they're always like, um, what, you know, what percentage of your people stay so long and all this other stuff. And I don't have all those stats, but I could tell you just – off the top of my head, I would say that my the women who are in the service probably stay four times longer than the average guy because I think the guy tends to, uh, the man, tends to have more of an ego and they try to make something happen all the time, whereas the women, I think, are more patient and they don't let that ego get in their way. And I'll flesh that out a little bit more details. I mean, we're all male and female subject to the same sort of feelings and emotions and such. But it just seems like 
the 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 a man is more likely to start day trading or change styles or do something differently or more aggressively at the absolute worst possible time. And I'll flesh it out in a second. Um, I think the real value in today's um, presentation is going to be on looking under the hood. I know I've done this several times in the past, but there's a couple of little angles I want to take today and show you some statistical things. But I think the main thing that's the most important thing is the empirical research, and that's looking at a lot of charts. And I want to kind of rehash and beat the dead horse, have you want to look at that today on that. And I do want to back it up with a few statistics. Um, so it's very important to dig underneath the hood when it comes to markets. So anything you guys want me to cover, uh, start thinking about your topics now. I know I've got a lot to cover, but uh, we should have some time to do that. And then when we get to the charts, you can start asking about individual stocks. The only, quite, only um, thing I ask for when we get to the charts is that you just ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about 100 stocks, but just put one stock, hit return, and then uh, bring up the next one. I left this in from last week because I think it's very relevant. And this is where I think some people are right now. It's like the market looked like it was going to make this transition, and you started looking for some of these transitional setups, and it didn't quite pan out. So I think some people may have thought, well, maybe it's just it's just not going to pan out, and it's not going to roll over, and maybe we should start uh, just – but it's not going up, so maybe we should start trading a reversion to the mean system. Or maybe I should just go in and change time frames and start doing day trading, and that's the worst time to do anything. So – Greg said the absolute worst time to create a change of rule is when you're mostly concerned about something that just doesn't seem not to be working correctly. Well, one thing I preach about over and over and over again when it comes to psychology, trader psychology, is know your methodology. You need to have some money management in place so that you take small losses and don't take any big losses that can materially, materially impact your lifestyle. And you have to learn how to control your emotions, okay? You have to embrace your emotions. You're, you're going to have emotions. You just have to recognize them and embrace them and deal with them. And uh, one way to help control that, obviously, money management is a huge part of that equation because if you're trading at too small, of, not too small of a size, if you're trading at a small enough size to where it's almost meaningless, then you're going to do the right thing. You're going to plan that trade and you're going to follow that plan. What I'm getting at is knowing your methodology. If you know that there will be flat times and somewhat negative times and times where you don't want to take a whole lot of action, and you you go through a few cycles of that, you begin to understand how things work. And then you go through a few good cycles, and you're like, wow, we print money for a while, and then we just kind of chop around for a while, and then we start printing money again. and and rinse and repeat, and I kind of get that cycle. It doesn't make it easy when it happens, but it makes it easier to deal with, okay? And there's some, like I was quoting, I've been quoting Mike Moody quite a bit lately. He, he gave a really good presentation, a really good presentation a few weeks back at the, um, at the American Association of Professional Technical Analyst Conference in Austin. And he called it baby poop, and that's a, that's a good way of looking at it. It's like if you're going to have a baby, you're going to have some baby poop. And I know I've been kind of maybe talking a little bit too much about the baby poop lately, but that's, that's where, we're, where we are. And it's always reassuring to see other professionals talk about these type of things, and it's like it makes you feel normal, like, hey, they deal, they deal with the same things too. And I know I've been talking a lot about Greg Morris's new book. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, not to name drop, I've just been reading his book lately. And he this morning I got to the part about whipsaws. And he says he hates them, and, but he's learned to deal with them over the years. And it's just one of those things where you take the good with the bad. So, But in knowing your methodology and knowing that you're going to have these flat times and these not so great times makes it a lot easier to live uh, with them, okay? No, not, not the Greg Morris from the original Mission Impossible. This is a different Greg Morris, um, although they're probably the same age now. 
Uh, yeah, black dude sidekick. He was the black dude sidekick. No, yeah, no, there's different Greg Morris, Jonathan. Um, anyway, so if you want to change styles of time frame, uh, don't because it's the worst thing you could you could possibly do. If you start doing more shorter term trading, when I say shorter term, I mean like if you start looking at things intraday, then every little tick becomes bigger than it is. Now, I'm guilty of watching the screen too much, but the difference between watching and acting are huge. Um, this morning, I came in. My lonely long stock was down. And I dropped an F-bomb, okay? Well, I'll come back a little while later or uh, more appropriately, I guess, I Actually, I looked up at my screen a little while later. I didn't leave or anything. And it's back in the green so far, knock on wood. So, I mean, had I been at breakfast when this happened, I would, would have gotten all emotional about it. So what I'm saying is watch the screen less and less, and that's vitally important. But it's okay to watch it. Just don't act upon it because you end up chasing your own tail. Um, as I said quite often, and I guess some people take offense to this, and, and I, I use the term crazy ass day trader every now and then, and I had a, I got some nasty letters from some people, so I guess I got to quit doing that. But I know a lot of day traders who have gone crazy, and that's, and that's why I <laughs> used that term. One of the reasons, uh, if you could do it, God bless you, but I can't imagine that you can make that many decisions, decisions every day and do it that often. So. Changing time frame is a bad idea. Changing styles is a bad idea, too. You will end up perpetually out of phase. The only way to ever make money in the market is to capture a trend. Write that down. If you're a contra trend trader, as soon as you get in the market, you better capture a trend. So my feeling is, why not be a trend trader all of the time? And the way to get tough, Tom Petty, had, Tom Petty uh, said it the best. The way to get is the hardest part, okay? He got it right. There are no income producing strategies. I've seen some things out there. I, this comes and goes, but you'll see every now and then somebody will talk about this income producing strategy or some sort of strategy. It makes it look like you just you just make money in the markets consistently, month after month, week after week, year after year. And there are no income producing strategies. I know some things you could do. I've been around markets enough to where you could, yes, produce some income over a period of time from the markets. But there are some very bad blow-up characteristics that come with those type of things. And trust me, I've had more experience uh, with these type of things than I care to even talk about. But there are no income producing strategies. So the market is not going to give you a consistent paycheck. But you can make money over a period of time, and then work to keep that money, okay? And then be patient until that next time frame comes along where conditions are once again conducive for what you're doing. Um, like I said last week, everybody in here, I know a lot of you personally, you're motivated individuals, doctors, and uh, I think we have a next transmission mechanic, uh, Don, you're in here. Um, <laughs> all jokes aside, um, you're highly motivated individuals. You, nope, there he is. Don's here. Um, so you're not prone to sit on your butt and do and not do anything. Okay, so that's the hard part, though. Um, it's kind of like the what's the old saying? It's like getting eaten by an alligator. It's like you. If an alligator bites you, and this is this isn't exactly true, but but there's a it's it's a thought that if you just kind of go limp, the alligator won't eat you. He'll eat you, but the more you move, the more he's going to eat you, and the more he's going to fight you back. And that's kind of like uh, where we have been recently. If you're trying to do too much in the choppy market, it's it's like fighting an alligator or getting eaten by an alligator. The more you move, the more he's going to eat you. And this is something that's really hard to wrap your head around. But every time we go through a choppy cycle, it just means more and more and more to me. The reason that trade following works is because sometimes it don't, okay? <laughs> and that's a hard thing to kind of wrap your head around. 
And, and it goes back to like the income producing strategies. It's like you start printing, and I see it happen all the time. My people, I have people, not my people, but people that come in and the market's doing this. In fact, I've got the chart here. I'll show you one, in one second. I left it in from last week. And they just absolutely love the methodology. And then the market does this, and then they go off to chase rainbows right about here. And then, of course, what happens, the market begins to trend again. So you really have to know these nuances. And again, not to beat a dead horse, you really have to live through a few cycles. Now, we talked about that a lot last week, so I don't want to beat up too much. But again, this is the, this is the, the slide I was talking about. Uh, very bravo for your system. And I've seen people I've, throughout the years, like I said, I've seen a lot of people come in and tell me that this is the best thing they have ever found in, in 20 years of searching. And they tell me how much money they made, and they tell me about how they failed at all these other things. And I'm like, hey, come, welcome aboard. Glad to have you. Glad you're making all that money. And then, of course, this isn't an exact period I'm thinking about, but something similar to this. They'll go through a period like this, and then all of a sudden, they go through this. And what do they say? Well, I think I'm going to go off and chase some rainbows. Now, here's the real value in today's presentation. Um, taking a look under the hood. So I want to jump out to the charts for a second and talk about this. One thing to certainly look at to begin with is the Rusty. And as I was putting this slide together, the Russell 2000 was making new lows for the year. And I like to use the IWM as a proxy for that. The main thing you want to do is you want to look at a lot of stocks. You want to ask you a few questions. So a few questions. Are they going up? Or are they going down? Or are they going sideways? Another thing that should just jump out at you when you're going through charts is these debacle du jours, meaning like these stocks that get these unbelievable haircuts overnight. And you don't want to think too much because we are technicians and we just follow the charts. But you have to ask yourself, what has really changed overnight in this company that gave them such a huge haircut overnight? Are they still in the energy business or whatever business they're in? Do they still have buildings and plants and et cetera? It's not like all of that evaporated overnight. I mean, I'm sure some drastic things can happen, but for the most part, a company that was in business yesterday, especially if it's a sizable company, the next day it's still in business and not a whole lot has changed, right? Maybe um, bad earnings or something, I don't know. But you see these stocks get absolutely torpedoed, and it's important to look for that. Uh, you, you need to look for leadership, if any, and leadership's been really narrow lately. So when you do see stocks going up, you're like, okay, what stocks are going up? Oh, okay, looks like some energy stocks are going up, some utilities are going up, selected REITs are going up. But that's about it, and some foods, mostly defensive-related issues is what I'm trying to say. Then you're like, well, wait a minute, this leadership's pretty narrow. And then, um, like, when I said I'm seeing any cockroaches, and it's like that's when you start – digging a little bit and we'll, I'll show you this in just one second but you look at a sector and it's going kind of sideways and lately if you dig a little further you'll find that wait a minute things aren't as rosy as they seem sometimes these subsectors are getting hit really hard and then sometimes within the sector there's a lot of issues or the majority of the issues are in downtrends but somehow that whole sector is being propped up in fact I did a whole column recently called what's propping up the peas and in that column I talked about the fact that the S&P was being held up by a few select issues and it was mostly the energies and, and before I forget one thing that I've been real concerned about is what's going to happen with these defensive issues not if when they correct and we might be seeing the beginning of that right now I haven't spent a lot of time in the charts this morning because I've been putting my slides together but I, from what little time I did, maybe we are getting to see the beginnings of that now. Now, let's, let's go in here. I want to show you a couple things. Um, one thing that's really good to do, and I preach about quite often, 
is to create a tradable universe. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this. Now, we spent a tremendous amount of time going through this at a stock selection webinar. And that's the key, this empirical research that you do every day, day in and day out, looking at chart after chart after chart, is vitally important. Okay. Now, I'm going to do all stocks. Uh, one thing that I've noticed recently, they do have a, a component for just the common stocks, and that's probably a good thing to do. The reason I like to look at all stocks is because I like to see the ETFs in here and pay attention to what's going on with the ETFs, and that kind of gives me a head start on my sector analysis. But if I copy all these flags, of symbols over, and I make my tradable universe, now what I'm doing here is I'm just making a list of more liquid stocks, uh, and I'm just using 250K as my average volume, which is a little bit on the thin side, admittedly, but liquid enough to trade, especially as a private trader like we all are, or most of us here, I should say. Um, and that gives you about 3,000 issues. That eliminates about half the stocks out of the database. Uh, maybe about eliminates a little bit more if you're just looking at the common stocks. And then I do like to sort them by 50-day HV. Before I do that, and I don't want to get into a whole lesson on this because I spent 16 hours in the stock selection webinar talking about these things. And it wasn't quite this boring. There was some more excitement to it. But I like to sort them by historical volatility. But before I do that, one thing I like to do, and this gives me a real good feel for what's going on with the market, is I like to sort them by price as a percent of the 52-week high. And from that, I build, uh, or I maintain, I should say, a momentum list. Now, right now, what's at 52-week highs? Well, we got a bond fund. A bond fund, a bond fund, a bond fund, a bond fund, okay, Unilever. Well, that's a food, okay. So, and then this is a company that's been bought out. We've got a bond fund. We've got a bond fund. We've got some sort of uh, energy company, okay, a food company. And I'm doing this on the fly, FYI, so I didn't, I didn't know it was going to come up this morning. I had a good idea, though, okay. Uh, we got a foreign ETF, we got a drug company, and we've got, I don't know what that is, it looks like a buyout, so I would eliminate that. We got a bond fund, okay? And you can see, oh, a utility, and then we got a bond fund. So what are we, what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing bond funds, utilities, foods, and Energies, and that's just going through the first few of these. And I like to go down through a couple hundred of these. And I can do it pretty quick because most of the stuff is stuff I'm not going to trade, especially if it's hit new highs, it hasn't pulled back. But I can go through a few hundred. And that gives me a good feel for what's going on and what's what's really uh, propping up the market, what's making the new highs, okay? Because those are the issues that are going to keep the indices at new highs. So after I do that, I sort them out by historical volatility 50 day and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this but the point I want to show you is that when you start looking through these charts and let's get through some of these ones at high levels get to a more meaningful historical volatility but even even high up in here you can see wow bam that stock got whacked that stock got whacked this stock looks like it's in a downtrend downtrend okay downtrend 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 Downtrend, 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 downtrend. So you can see going through these, and I haven't found one in uptrend yet. Now, these are the more volatile stocks, okay? Most of these stocks are headed lower, and quite a few of them have been getting whacked as of late. So if you come in on a day like today, right here, stock gets about a 50% haircut overnight. So that goes on your debacle du jour, du jour list. This one got whacked. Well, wait a minute. This is an oil company. I thought oil companies were doing well. So downtrend, 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 downtrend. Oh, but you got this one crazy stock in here that's going up. That one was kind of going up. Downtrend. So you can see it going through these stocks. It's pretty obvious downtrend, 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 that most downtrend, downtrend, or in downtrends. And then you, you'll see that there's quite a few debacle de jours in here, okay? 
So when you go through this list, and then you go through, I like to go through my list of stocks that are set up as pullbacks. So that's a very loose parameter list, too. And you see where the setups are set setting up. And then when you do that, you'll have a couple of energy stocks that are setting up, a couple of foods that are setting up. But for the most part, most stocks are in downtrends. Let me make a note on this one. Let's, I'll come back. To, well, I'll get it later. So this gives you a pretty good feel for what's really going on within the market. Okay. Well, let's just take a look at the rusty first. So look at that. Another downtrend. Imagine that. Downtrend, 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 downtrend. So a lot of these stocks are in downtrends. Now, it's a little bit, I guess, one thing you have to realize is that we are looking at the more volatile stocks to begin with. But that's still very useful information. The reason that's useful is when momentum shifts, okay, or when the market dynamics shift, the money flows away from the momentum issues, which are the more volatile issues, as a general statement. And as you could just as you just saw, most of those stocks are downtrends. And the money runs into more defensive issues. And what did we see earlier? Foods, utilities, energies. It uptrends. So the money runs into those issues. So that's something that you could see very quickly empirically by flipping through these charts. Okay. Now it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that the Russell 2000 is in a downtrend. If you didn't know that it was in a downtrend, this is one thing I was doing last night in my service. I like to draw a trend line through as many bars as possible. Mathematically, this is equivalent to linear regression. And if you want to mess around with linear regression, I, I would encourage you to do so. Don't get too crazy with a bunch of indicators. But if you want to mess around with linear regression, you'll see that a linear regression line is going to look a lot like my trend line. This is a linear regression line here. It's going to look a lot like my trend line or be very simple or similar. In one of my templates, I always forget which one it's in, one of these things, oops, uh, one of these things I have a bunch of uh, linear regression lines. And if you get bored, do like a, um, sorry about that, let me get rid of that. I, for some reason it's automatically, but it's pulling up um, Camtasia. Anyway, uh, it's a good, good exercise to plot a whole bunch on a chart because sometimes, It'll kind of wake you up, but it should be pretty obvious that this market is in a downtrend. And you can see that as we are where we are right now, if the market would close here, we would be at new lows for the year. Now, what is this? This is the rusty, okay? How many stocks are the rusty? 2,000. That's a broad-based index, so it looks like it's headed lower. The other thing I've been doing a lot of, we talked about it over the last couple of weeks. Let me clean the chart up a little bit is I've been looking at the proper order of the moving averages, the bow tie moving averages, that is. And notice that the 10 is below the 20 and the 20 is below the 30, okay? As a general statement, if you only traded when the 10 was above the 20 and the 20 was above the 30 on the long side, as a general statement, you would be on the right side of the market, okay? And when the bow ties are a downtrend proper order. If you only trade on the downside, as a general statement, you would be on the right side of the market. Does it always work? Nothing always works, okay? But it gives you a pretty good feel for what's going on. So it's pretty obvious. If you don't have time to do all that research that I love to do every night, then uh, you could pay me to do it for you, which I'd be happy to do. I think I have room for one more person on the service. Or uh, take a look at the Russell, okay? Now, the Russell doesn't give you the whole picture. Okay, but it does show you that in general stocks have been headed lower as of late. We'll come back to the NASDAQ and the P's in a little while and look at that. Now, one other thing I want to look at is when you are, this, is, this comes back to the what's really going on type of thing. Uh, computer hardware is a pretty cool sector to kind of pick apart a little bit, okay? So if we change our watch list to the stocks there, okay, and we see we got 75 stocks within this sector, 
And there's two ways of looking at it. Let's just see what stocks are in uptrends based on this uptrend proper order. And there's a couple of stocks for some reason that are in this sector. I don't know why they're in this sector, but they need to come out. But I was doing the math earlier today, and I think there's th – these are the sectors themselves. This has got to come out. Um, and this one comes out. So if you – one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven stocks here that are in uptrend proper order. And if you look at that one and take that one out too, now it gives you six. Let's just see what they are. Okay. And even though six, it's, it's kind of hard to get too excited about them. I mean, this stock here is going sideways for quite a while. Uh, this one, that's in a bona fide uptrend. That looks pretty good. That's SanDisk. And then, of course, Apple's in there. But if you take out SanDisk and Apple, there's not a whole lot that looks that great. So you've got a sector where you've got 75 stocks, and some of those would come out. So let's just say 70 stocks. What's 5 divided by 70? That's about, you got about 5 stocks and uptrends based on that metric. And you've got 70 stocks in the sector overall. So 71% of the stocks are not trending within the sector. Now let's take a look at the overall sector here. You can see this overall sector is not too far from all-time highs. But there's only a handful, literally 5 okay stocks within the sector that are in uptrends based on the metric of the 10-day simple is above the 20-day exponential and the 20-day exponential is above the 30-day exponential and the overall sector has the 10 above the 20 and the 20 above the 30 but when you dig within there's only a few stocks my concern lately has been, okay, well, there's a couple of canaries within this coal mine. Apple, mostly, for the most part, and SanDisk, SMDK. So what's going to happen with those two areas? Correct, as we're seeing a little bit of today. And on a bigger picture scale, my concern has been, and I know, just bear with me, I've, I've been talking about this ad nauseum, but what's going to happen when these defensive issues begin to correct, especially the energies, because there's a lot more higher volatile stocks within the energies than in the foods and within the utilities. But you can see that the energies are having a fairly serious correction today. This chart is delayed, but uh, when I did an update a few minutes ago, the energies were down about 1% on the day. So that's my concern is what's going to happen when the energies begin to correct in earnest. Now, what I've noticed within the energies, we talked about this a minute ago, is the Baco de Jours. And um, it's kind of been like a cockroach market lately. And I know that the theory kind of applies to like earnings on a stock and all. It's, it, it's a fundamental thing it's where I first heard it. But a cockroach, you see a cockroach, it's like, oh, cockroach. Oh, just one little cockroach. But what you need to realize is there's probably a bunch more. If you're seeing one or two, there's probably a bunch more. And lately, this has been a cockroach kind of market. The more you look, it seems like the more you find. And take a look at EGY and then PVA, GPOR, and SGY. And those are a few that I remember from recently. But there's quite a few more energy stocks that have been breaking down as of late. A lot of debacle is yours within energies. Now, I just showed you these really cruddy-looking stocks, and most of these stocks are fairly sizable stocks. But the sector overall is looking pretty darn good. So you got to make sure you dig within. Now, I'm not saying, okay, I'm bearish. I'm going to find everything bearish in the world. Okay, You can't go crazy bearish and label yourself a bear or label yourself a bull or whatever you want. You just can't use a label and go out and find everything that supports your argument. I know it seems like I'm doing that a little bit today. But what I'm actually doing is I'm showing you what I'm seeing. I'm not looking for a debacle du jour. But when I'm flipping through my charts, okay, 
And I see a stock that looks like that, or there's there's one. Is it EOG? There's one of them. Nope. EGY. I forget which one it was. It wasn't GPOR, but it was one sort of like GPOR. And GPOR is a good example. But if I flip it through my charts, and this was about a six or seven days ago, and I see a stock getting haircut like this overnight, I'm not looking for that, but I'm certainly not going to ignore it when it pops up. Okay, so lately it's been a market where the more you look, the more you see. Now, for those who like to quantify things, I did uh, run some interesting statistics. Uh, statistics are worthless. I know 75% of all people know that, or 75.2% of all people know that. But one thing I was looking at is if you take your list of stocks, and these numbers are going to be much worse after uh, today's. Let's see if I can get this back up. If you take your list of tradable stocks, and then in reality, for the most part, now we'll trade some between 20 and 30 HV every now and then. And even between 20 and 30, the uh, 20 and high, higher it still looks pretty ugly. But the point I'm trying to make is the stocks that we are most likely to trade, okay? Out of all of those stocks in a tradable universe from an HV of 30 or higher, only 23% of those stocks, 23.4% to be perfect um, to the decimal, or in uptrends, meaning that the 10 is greater than the 20 is greater than the 30. And that's just based on that one metric, okay? I would never, ever trade a market just because the 10 is greater than 20, greater than 30, because sometimes they could be absolutely flat and slightly higher, okay? That doesn't necessarily be there. The rip roaring uptrend, and it doesn't, by the same token, or on the flip side, I should say, it doesn't be there at a solid downtrend. But just based on this metric, which in general, if the 10 is greater than 20 and greater than 30, kind of like hardware we just looked at, it's a, a general uptrend, and if the 10 is less than the 20, the 20 is less than the 30, meaning that the proper order is down, then in general, it's probably in a downtrend, okay? And 62.2% of the more tradable stocks are in downtrends. Now, you'll notice you add these two up. It doesn't come, uh, come quite to 100% because that means the rest of the stocks are somewhere between where your moving averages might look like that, just kind of meandering around. So if you do want to back it with stats, very few stocks are actually trending right now. Now, the reason I'm making such a big, huge case on this, and I'm going on and on, is because the S&P, as you know, has been signaling an all clear. And this is why I've written so many columns about that you can't just that about not taking the market at face value. And we had all-time highs a few days ago on Monday, to be exact, and on Tuesday, too, okay? Then look what happens on Wednesday, and then today we're coming right back in. So it's kind of beginning to unwind a little bit, at least while, at least in today's presentation. The thing that's been worrying me a lot is I've never seen it happen so slowly. It's kind of a weird situation where it's like slowly unwinding, but then somehow the S&P is making new highs. And I kind of equated it to boiling a frog. You put a frog in warm water, and he's like, yeah, it's nice and warm. And if you slowly warm that water up, the frog is going to just kind of relax, and before you know it, you're going to boil the frog. And my column that I did a few days ago was on will the frog boil. And now I'm beginning to wonder, and this was actually going to turn out to be a big positive day in the market, I think. I think it was on Monday. So now the question is, is the frog boiling now? And all the things I'm showing you today, it's not like these happened overnight. A lot of those debacle du jours I'm showing you happened a week ago, okay? A lot of the narrow leadership happened a month ago or more. So I think it's like I woke up this morning saying, I don't have any gee whiz things to show you. I don't have any new patterns. I don't have anything exciting to show you. But 
it all comes back to what do you want to hear and what do you need to hear when I put together these presentations. And what you need to hear today is you need to hear that you need to look within the market. You need to spend a lot of time and see what's really going on. You need to keep an open mind so you don't get too bearish or too bullish in, in the process. And you really need to pay attention to what's happening. If you don't have time to do it all, start with the Russell, maybe run some stats. Be careful because you get in a lot of trouble with statistics, okay? And then, of course, you can always have me do the research for you, okay? So now it looks like the frogs are beginning to boil. Like I said, I've never seen it. I've, I just, it baffles me. I've never seen it unwind so slowly. And that's why I feel like I've been fear mongering in the column. But and that's why I wrote a couple of days ago. It's like, am I the only one seeing this? And then, you know, you guys are awesome. Got a lot of emails from you saying, no, Dave, I see it too. So it's like, makes me feel good. Makes me feel like my work is done. Now let's take a let's just see what else is in the slides. Um, we talked a little bit about ebb and flow yesterday, and uh, or I should say last week. And I talked about how the Mike Tyson quote: "Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face." And I saw that unwind, or I have been seeing it unwind over the last couple of weeks. Okay, um, these positions started stopping out. And I got a lot of emails and phone calls. Hey, Dave, well, what do you think we stay with it? Just a few more days. What if? We, why don't we just stick with it and see what happens? And my answer is no. Nope, you got stopped out. You got stopped out. Okay. Either at a profit or a loss, you take your lumps or you take your profit and you move on. So you don't want to panic and be a deer in the headlights when the time comes to honor that stop. So it's like Mike Tyson says, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. And it's like all of a sudden the market, bam, begins to kind of decimate or feels like it's decimating the portfolio. Well, that's where you have to take action or more importantly, take no action let the stops take you out. Occasionally, you'll have a stock nick where it comes down, touches the little stop, it goes right back up. That's a different story. We're talking about people who are letting it blow through the stop and keep on going. And the bottom line is he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Oh, I have that in the slides. I didn't even realize it was in the slides. Um, and, again, see it as a cleansing process, okay? And, again, being flat is okay. Put your little egos aside for you guys in here, okay? Uh, patience in existing positions. Now, one thing you'll find is when you're making a transition, in the real world, it'd be great. You get knocked out of some positions, you lose a little money, you make a little money, depends on what the case may be, or stopped out of some of your profitable positions and maybe stopped out a few stinkers. And then you start putting on some new positions, and those new positions work right away. Well, the market doesn't always adhere to your time frame. We've got three positions on now. We got knocked out of everything else, and all three of those positions are underwater. Okay, one might be close to breaking even today, but I think it's underwater. So you can't expect to get paid every day. You can't expect that that permanent income hypothesis that some people out there sell. I could probably sell a, a, an income system, make a couple of billion dollars, and, and run away. <laughs> you know, but I, it's disingenuous. You, could, I, I couldn't sleep at night. Okay, knowing that. Um, and again, patience, patience, patience. The short side. It's easy to be right on the short side. It's hard to make money. That's something that's hard to wrap your head around. You want to talk about something that messes with you psycho psychologically? My claim to fame is I'm always ripe and early on the short side. It absolutely kills me. <laughs> it's like this, this train wreck that, that I think that we could be in right now. And again, I don't want to get too bearish, but... It's like I've seen it unwind for so long, and, and have I made a fortune in the process? No, not yet at least, okay? Short side's tough. Short side, it looks like everything's going to die. You get in, what happens, the market goes straight up, and then what happens, then it dies, okay? <laughs> so 
it's not easy, and it's pretty tough. So it's easy to be right, hard to make money. Um, I don't want to beat the dead horse on this. We were just talking about it. We had a pretty good run uh, on the ebb and flow. A couple of random thoughts, and we'll hop into the charts. Um, the frog boils, okay? And that's what I'm wondering is happening today, is the frog beginning to boil. Uh, the the market adages, which I stole from Linda Rasky, and she got somewhere else after I asked her about it, come to mind, a couple of them. Uh, the market will do what it has to do to cause the most pain to the most people. And it will also do the most obvious, and is a corollary to that, it will also do the most obvious and the most unobvious fashion. So if it's going to go down, like I said earlier, 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 what's going to happen first? It's going to have a big old rally. Squeeze out the shorts. Uh, suck in the long. Squeeze out the shorts. And then what it's going to do? It's going to do the most obvious, okay? So it'll do the most obvious in the most unobvious manner, and in the process, it's going to cause the most paid to the most people, okay? Question, now, is now a good time to buy bonds? Um, well, their bonds are a little high right now, okay? So I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, but I guess as a trade follower, the answer should be yes, okay? You probably want to be long bonds. Um, hard for me to get that excited about bonds. They don't move around a lot. It's hard to get capital gains. But I guess as a general statement, yes, because they're going higher. Uh, but you're not going to make a lot of money in them. Uh, in my Landry 100 list, which is a list of um, 100 momentum stocks, I've been taking out a lot of stocks lately, and I've been adding in a bunch of bond funds. Well, the bond funds are just pretty much placeholders. I don't see them as something that's going to make a lot of money. For instance, like a Tesla or whatever, I took Tesla out a while back, and it came out as like 163% gain or 263%, something ridiculous. You're not going to make that kind of move in something like bonds. But, yeah, bonds are going higher, so sure, you know, be long bonds, but you're just not going to make a lot of money in bonds, at least on a, on a percentage basis. And something bad could always happen, even in these lower volatility markets. So I'm just not a big fan of trading bonds. And I'm also not a big fan of uh, playing the only game in town. Okay, we're long one energy stock right now. We're long rice, R-I-C-E. Uh, even though energies have been going up, I haven't been that excited about going after the energies because it's the only game in town. Okay? And what's going to happen when the market begins to crack? Do you have enough history in your stats to know what turning points might be likely? Uh, Phil, I don't, I don't have the, I don't run a lot of statistics. I'll run statistics at a time like right now to show people what I'm seeing empirically and to kind of convince myself or kind of to back up what I'm doing. Um, I think you can get in a lot of trouble with statistics. I've, I've done a lot of mechanical testing early in my career. I've done some consulting with mechanical testing where I where I used to consult for people who were running mechanical systems and such and I'd help them build their systems. Um, and from that I've learned that you're better off being an empirical or discretionary trader. Go back to 2007 and if you want download the archives if you want to go go in and watch it October 2007. And, and I don't want to say this too much because it makes me sound like one of those guys that gets on TV, like, oh, call the top. Well, I was apologizing to my clients because all we had was shorts showing up, and the S&P was making all-time highs. But when you see those things kind of happen and you see it kind of come unf unfolding, regardless of what statistics are telling you, you need to pay attention. And that's why I think that it's important to be a discretionary type of trader where it, it do a lot of empirical research, look at a lot of charts, so you know that what's really so you know what's really going on under the hood, and that's my whole point there. But yeah, if you want to play around with some stuff, I mean, it's fun to play around with a lot of those things. Um, I'll look at every now and then. Lately, I have to admit, I've been looking at some advanced decline type of stuff. But I think that when you go in and you look at a couple thousand charts every day. 
like the little exercise we just did a few minutes ago, if you had gone through the rest of those uh, 18 or 1900 charts, whatever it was, and you see downtrend, 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 in the back of your mind, you got to be thinking, geez, stocks are in a downtrend. And I think that's much more important than running a bunch of stats. And I've done a lot of that research in the past, and I've ran a lot of stats, and I've looked at a lot of different things. And I just keep coming back to looking at a lot of stocks, looking at a lot of sectors, and then studying the indices. And when I look at those indices, I already know what's going on, okay? If I see a whole bunch of stocks that went down today, I know that the breadth of the market was very bad. And then I look at the Russell, and I'll see the Russell's down. It's like, oh, it just kind of confirms what I'm seeing internally. So the whole point of today's lesson is look at a lot of charts. Look at what's going on under the hood. Okay, uh, let me just let me just get off the let me finish the slides real quick, and we'll hop straight into the charts. Okay. Uh, one thing I said last few weeks is they're not going to make it easy on us. It's not going to be a route, meaning that it's not going to be like this. Okay, it's going to probably be like that, and that's how it's been so far. Take a look at the Nasdaq. The Nasdaq is pretty much a poster child for the type of downtrend we've been in. Uh, the Russell, like I said, is more of a poster child for what's really going on in the market. Uh, play a good, continue to play your good offense. Okay. Make sure you got the best of the best setups. The reason I don't like playing the only game in town is because, let's say we got the energies going higher, and we'll just throw in utilities, REITs, and whatever else, foods or whatever. And then we've got 99% of all other stocks going down. Well, it's kind of like the rising tide lifts all boats. I know energies can sometimes trade independently. But if you're going to trade these energies or pick one of these other couple of rallying areas, the the weight of evidence is against you, okay? So with this market, if this market goes down, chances are pretty, hard, pretty uh, good that these are going to go down too. The other thing too with these few defensive areas that are at high levels is they're priced for perfection. And I, have a, I get a lot of questions on that, and I, and I don't know the best way to explain it other than it's like the price has ran its course. Um, by the time a sector is up a couple hundred percent, it's probably overanalyzed, over scrutinized, and the company would have to come out and um, and do really really well. They can't miss an earnings or anything. Uh, they would have to perform well. Let's say that some some little bad news comes out, the stock begins to implode. I'm in a webinar. Okay. Um, anyway, sorry about that. How many times I have to tell you? I do a webinar every Thursday. I don't <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, anyway, so uh, continue to play a good offense. And if it's the only, if you have to really, really like a setup now, and you really need to be in show me mode. Okay. All right, this is going to look like a show. I don't know if I should read this or not. I guess I'll read it. <laughs> Stress watching the Landry List, recording CXDC. Everyone should think about using the service. Most people are out fixing automatic transmissions or saving lives, and the service is less than a six-pack a day for the service and, and picks and market analysis. I have to be careful here. I don't want to raise the price, but it's way worth it. Well, Craig, thank you so much. And I guess I need to add um, out training dogs to my list of things that people are out doing that are wonderful. And Craig's a dog trainer. So if you need, any, if you need your dog trained, give me a holler. I'll, I'll make the connection for you. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, I've left this slide in forever. I just think it just, it's just such a cool slide. Be careful if you're flipping this switch for bull to bear or whatever because you're going to get stuck on one side or the other. And I know I'm getting kind of ominous and bearish on you now, but bearish, my, my Cajun just slipped out of me. Anyway, um, but you have to believe in what you see and not in what 
I always say believe in what you're seeing, not in what you believe. But believe in what you're seeing, not what you want to believe, okay? So be careful if you um, are on one side or the other. Uh, a couple of, a couple of announcements, and then we'll get into the stock. Start, uh, give me your stock picks now, and we'll uh, we'll get into them in just a few seconds. Um, the uh, stock selection webinar. I know there was a misprint somewhere on the site where it said six months. Uh, if you buy the stock selection webinar, you get the whole you get a whole year of the service. Okay, and it was pretty cool. Uh, things worked out pretty cool back then. We did have one thing that did really help it work out was we did have a. Uh, big rally in IPOs back then. It was an IPO bubble. And I told everybody during the webinar that, boy, I'm really thinking about doing an IPO service. And we did cover IPOs in the webinar, by the way. And I didn't do an IPO service because I said, you know what? These IPOs are in a bubble. And then I watched the bubble go on for the next couple of months. And it was a pretty amazing ride in some of these IPOs. And then I got to thinking about it. When's the best time to plant a tree? Some of you might know this. 20 years ago, okay? The second best time to plant a tree is today. So what I think I might do is I think I'm going to do a webinar just on trading IPOs. And anyone who has purchased the stock selection webinar, I'll give you the IPO webinar free, a live webinar, maybe like a four-hour webinar on IPOs because I'm thinking about it this way it's like if you don't get educated on the nuances of IPOs the cool things about IPOs then you're not going to be ready when the next bubble comes along whether that bubbles later this year next year or the year afterwards, okay? And then you're also you also might miss a few great little stocks in between. Like I said earlier, we're only long one energy stock, and that energy stock happens to also be an IPO. Sometimes these IPOs can trade contra to the overall market. I think it's a huge opportunity in IPOs. So I think I'm probably going to do something with IPOs. And anybody who signs up for this or has signed up for this will get that free. Anyway, enough of the pimping on uh, my stuff. But uh, check it out if you get a chance. It, it again, you know, it's one year in the service, not six months on that. And my first two books still available. Check out my website for more on that. I've got a limited supply of flash drives available if you want the archives for these shows. If you get 2012, 2013, um, that's over 60 hours worth of uh, education. Had a pretty good deal. And I think I cover a lot of good stuff in these shows. If you just um, Following along, meaning actually implementing it, is the tough part. But the information is certainly there. Okay, the plan your trade and trade your plan. It's all in there. All right, let's um, let's hop out to the markets real quick. Obviously, I've, I've kind of touched a lot of it on the market to begin with, and we'll get it to your individual stock picks. Uh, let's take a look at the P's real quick. Obviously, in the P's. We're having a pretty bad day, and just a few days ago, the market was breaking out. I know I've kind of beat the dead horse on this, but one thing that I think you really have to watch for, excuse me, one thing you really have to watch for in a market, especially a range-bound market, is... You can't get too bullish when it's at the top of the range, okay? And you can't get too bearish when it's at the bottom of the range, okay? Now, it did kind of dip below a little bit, but there was no follow-through here. And notice that it peaked above a couple of days ago, but there was no follow-through there. So follow-through is key. So be careful if you be careful thinking about breakouts. Don't anticipate the breakout. You're much better off letting a market break out, prove itself, and then look to play that first pullback. Okay. Okay. Um, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Let me see if I can get my 
charge to cooperate here. Okay. NASDAQ's getting whacked pretty hard in here. If you draw your lines, okay, the, the easiest thing to do when you're trying to determine a trend in its most basic form is let's pick like your highest close, which is right there. And then pick your, well, pick today. <laughs> Go to today. Fast forward to today. Okay. And then connect the dots between those lines. That's your net, net move. So when in doubt, take the short out. And which way is that market headed? Now, I know it's not quite that simple. And there's a few more things you need to do. And you might want to take a look at a net, net move on a shorter term time frame. Okay. So on a shorter term time frame, let's draw in a net net move. And when in doubt, take the chart out. So shorter term, we see this market is mostly sideways. It's worked its way a little higher on a net net basis. But the big thing to glean from this is that the trend is down. Okay. A uh, couple other things. I don't know if it's worthy of a whole uh, webinar on this. But one thing, again, I like to draw a line through as many bars as possible. Sometimes I like to connect the high to the low. Okay, and in doing that, your chart would kind of look like this, and I guess that's kind of what they call a swing chart. Um, again, I'm not—I don't have any rules. I don't want to quantify it. Okay, uh, I've seen rules where I guess in this particular case, because this swing low and this swing high didn't get um, taken out, then you're still in this swing here, or you're still in this downswing, I guess, or just bouncing in between. But it doesn't take rocket science science to see that we're going kind of sideways here. NASDAQ not too far from new lows for the year. Let's take a look at the Rusty again. And the Rusty, a little bit more obvious in its downtrend. And when you do some of these things I just did, like let's connect the high to the low, well, now we've got a new low to work with. So now you're looking like that, okay? So that's a little bit easier now with today's low in place, okay? So when in doubt, let's take the chart out. Which way is that market headed? Anyone? Come on. You need, you need, I know. Okay, wait. I, you haven't, I haven't showed you this in a while, but let me show you. Let me show you the back of my business card. Okay. Send me a self-addressed envelope to um, Cynthia Trading, LLC, P.O. Box. Two nine eight. A beta. This is where they make the beer. Of course, my beer is better. I own a microbrewery. Seven zero four two zero. Okay. And I'll send you a business card. And if you ever get lost in the market, flip it over. And look right here. I know it's a lot more. It's a little bit more to it than just that. But you'd be surprised. How many times I get emails with a market that looks like that? Hey, Dave, I'm thinking about buying this. Really? Are you a trend follower? <laughs> I mean, this, is, this is how I got the name trend following moron, by doing simple stuff like this. And the person who gave me that name, I'm pretty sure I know who it is, was a person who was fighting the market at the time and was a person that should not be fighting the market. It's uh, someone who you probably read about at some point if you read all these books on all these famous guys. And um, I think that was the beginning of a, of a I'm not going to say a falling out because he was anonymous and I can't prove that it was him, but I'm pretty sure it was him. <laughs> I'm not laughing because he was getting buried, but I'm just saying he was fighting a trend and he got mad at me because every day in my column I would draw a big blue arrow in the opposite direction of his position, which was I'm just following a trend, like a good little trend following moron, okay? Okay, thanks again, Craig. I see that, uh, the great comments, I appreciate it. Uh, Stephen, we got you. Oh, what else is going on? Um, I think I got to beat the dead horse, the, just a few areas rallying in here. Uh, let me just show you a couple other things that are happening. 
Most sectors not looking that great, obviously. Let's see if I can find the service. Here we go. Um, the EFA shares have kind of hung in there, and there's a few areas around the world, like India, I've been looking at that are doing pretty good. My problem is if we begin to crack, they begin to crack. Okay? Uh, I'll mark it down today. Their mark it's down today. If we sneeze, I think they still get a cold. Um, every week I say someday I might be willing to change that, but that someday hasn't come just yet. Uh, some of these areas that have broken out, like chemicals, have now come all the way back in. So just use a little common sense and look at these things. You say, okay, well, they're just they're at new highs. They're no longer at new highs. They're coming right back in. And then, like I said earlier or implied earlier, you take a look at, like, the banks. Now, they're beginning to implode a little bit today. But as of yesterday, they're kind of lower to sideways. But then when you look at the charts within, bam, 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 all these areas, all these stocks within are in pretty serious downtrends. Again, it's a cockroach type of thing. The more you look, the more you find. Transports, what area I really hadn't talked about much lately because it just had one big day in here. But it did make it to all-time highs. Uh, Dow theorists, I'm sure, were uh, – um, what's a polite way of putting it? Uh, very excited. Let's just leave it at that before I get myself in trouble and say something um, I shouldn't. But I'm sure the Dow theorists were very excited. I, I'm not going to pick on them because I, I, it, I don't trade Dow theory. I don't know. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. It's been around for a while. It's probably nothing wrong with it. Uh, but I know that they probably got excited because the transports gave them a confirmation. But to me, it just seemed like one of those things where it's like, boy, this is just an extra – little hook they're putting in here, it's like an extra little uh, trickery type of deal, you know, S&P breaks out the new highs, oh, look, transport's new highs, uh, come on in, the water's fine, so that's kind of how I saw that, but I'm willing to believe in what I see, if the transports keep going up, and then all these other sectors start joining suit, okay, following suit, I should say, then I get a little bit more excited. Uh, anything technology related, as you would expect, or most anything technology related, uh, has been getting hit fairly hard. Semiconductors breaking down a little bit as we speak. Uh, when you dig again, another more co you know another cockroach theory here. When you dig within the sectors, this arrow was drawn a couple of weeks ago. But when you dig a little further into all these sectors, most subsectors look worse than the overall sector. How could that be? Well, the reason that could happen is you've got a few stocks that are holding up the whole sector. You got the apples and the sand disk holding up computer hardware and not much else. And again, that's why I wrote that column, what's propping up the piece. So go back a couple of weeks if you have time, if you're bored, or if you can't sleep, and reread that column I wrote about what's propping up uh, the trees. Is there a free charting service I could follow other than telecharts? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, I have a subscription to another charting service, and it's um, it's okay. I'm not going to talk about it because they refuse to make me an affiliate, so I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> but they have a free version of their software. If you poke around the internet, you could find it. But if they make me an affiliate, I'll uh, I'll tell them. And I, I I promote stuff that I actually use, and obviously I use the heck out of telecharts. So I'm not even sure where I stand with my affiliate with them. Um. Hey, Dave, when a TKO is – okay, uh, all right, enough. Of, I think we've, we've kind of beat the dead horse. One more thing I just want to point out to you. Even within some of these stronger areas, like I said, you got the debacle of the jours and this. I think like within utilities you had like WEC comes to mind. Um, you could see that you've got like a first thrust setting up in WEC. By the way, it's a good-looking setup. Um, I didn't realize it was actually set up. So when you dig within these sectors, again, not to beat the dead horse, it looks kind of ugly. But now also pay attention to the overall sector itself. And this is where some simple little things like the net net thing can help out too. I, I promise we're going to get to the stocks. And where are utilities now? Draw your little line. Where were they, oh, a little while ago? You know, connect the connect the closes. So at the least they're doing this. Shorter term. They're doing this. What does that look like? That looks like a micro first thrust to me or a pioneer first thrust. Yeah, Frenchie, good point. I forgot to mention that. I thought that he said a, char a free charting source. He said other than telecharts. 
So I thought Gary knew. Yeah, freestockcharts.com. Um, and you could do a lot of what I'm doing here uh, with that. So check that out, freestockcharts.com. That's Telecharts' free version of their charting package, which it's pretty impressive. Um, you know, if, if if I'm on the, in fact, I if I'm on the fly, or if you're somebody like a student, like I had a student in my office a few months back for or very just for like 20 minutes, and I had to teach him how to trade in 20 minutes. It's basically, I said, buy new highs, and when they tell you to sell something, sell anything that's at a loss. That's that was his trading system that he's going to follow. Uh, and he used we we I've forgotten about freestockcharts.com, so I've, I've realized at the last minute and I said, oh, here's your charting package. Use this. Um, but yeah, freestockcharts.com. But I, he said other than telecharts. So, but yeah, if you're not familiar with that, Gary, use that one. That's a good way to get started. All right, let's go ahead. I think I've made my case or beat the dead horse on everything. So let's uh let's do this. Let's open it up for uh, individual stocks. Uh, there's a few stacking up already. Uh, GTAT, GTAT, GTAT is broken down. I think. Oh, that's TAT. Oh, look, TAT. I can make a joke about that. <laughs> Uh, GTAT looks pretty good as a possible short. Uh, what I like here is that I like that you got a little bit. Uh, you got a couple things working for you. So uh, this might be the first, uh, almost a high five on the day. You've got the sideways action here, and then now it's begun to break down, and now it's pulled back a little bit. Let's put it to moving averages, and you can see, lo and behold, kind of got a bow tie. Well, not exactly, not the cleanest bow tie in the world. I wouldn't even call it a bow tie, but close enough. But what I am seeing is a thrust down followed by a pullback with a big mountain of overhead supply. And to those of you who are familiar with the pattern, it's also a bit of a an inverted cup and handle. Okay, so I think yeah, I think this looks pretty good. Well, what a what a great stock to start the uh, start the presentation off with. From great to crappy, let's uh, let's knock out Ford for Mr. Don. Don's here. <laughs> What does Don want to know about Ford? Uh, no, it's going sideways. So my arrow still remains in place there. Um, there's really nothing to say about that. I guess I need to get Nicholas queued up just in case. No. Coop for our win. Coop. Oh, don't make me use Nicholas right out of the box. No. <laughs> you want to short that? What do you want to do with that? It's going to be hard to borrow because it's a relatively new issue, okay? And I, I forget the, the number of days. I'll have to look it up. Um, I'm a technician, so I don't pay attention to too many things outside of technicals. But I do know in, in some of my IPR research, just kind of found out by accident some things, uh, and I am digging into a few little things that, that will help to explain what I'm finding in the markets with the IPOs. But one thing that you have to realize is unless you're an insider or an institution, I should say, you can't short an IPO. There's a there's a limited period of time. So I don't know I don't know exactly what that period of time is. I'll have to find out. Uh, but at, at any rate, it's going to be hard to borrow, especially this is a fairly thin stock in here. Uh, this stock looks like it's at a pretty serious downtrend. Just draw your arrows. So unless you want to short that, which I think it'd be hard to do, I'll avoid it. When, so I don't, I don't mean to pick on you, um, but we we need to make examples of these uh, things. LCI for Phil. I know what you're doing, Phil. Okay, I I would say no because it doesn't fit my methodology, but I know exactly what he's doing. He's putting the 50-day moving average in there, and I bet you a hundred bucks. Bam! It hit that 50-day. <laughs> That's exactly what he's doing. What Phil's doing is he sees a stock that breaks down well below its 50, and he's waiting for it to come back to kiss that 50-day moving average goodbye, and then he's looking for the next leg lower. Um, yeah, I see what you're doing, Phil. I think it's in trouble. It doesn't fit my methodology, or I should say it no longer fits my methodology. I bet if I put in a bow tie moving average, yeah, you would have had a trigger right here in your bow tie. Okay. But, yeah, see, that's ripe and early. See, the bow tie was right. But a little early because you got this retrace back up in here. And where did it stop? It stopped at the 50. So 
Nothing wrong with using that 50 there, Phil. Keep on doing it. I think you're on to something. Here's the deal. Anything that's trend-based will work like a friggin' charm with the market trends. So if you're playing pullbacks to the 50 or you're playing bow ties, whatever you want to do, or TKOs or whatever, if the market's trending and you're trading a trending-based methodology, you're going to do just fine. If the market's not trending, eh, not so much. And that's what you got to wrap your head around. And when we, we're working on the layman's guide to trading stocks, that's one thing that was added to the pullbacks when I said trading pullbacks. Instead of saying trading pullbacks, we added the phrase trading pullbacks in trending markets. Okay, And that's sort of the caveat there that makes it all worthwhile. That actually makes it work. So if it's not trending then you don't want to do it. Uh, right now, I wouldn't personally go after this. It's going sideways too much. It's chopped around too much. When a stock cracks, I like to see a stock crack from high levels, pull back a little bit, and then crack again. I don't like to see this pullback here get drawn out. It's like it gives uh, everyone too much time to think. But I know what you're doing. I see what you're doing. And I can't, I can't argue with it from my standpoint, though it's not something uh, that I would do. Yeah, okay, Phil. Well, Phil says you can look at a weekly and trade my methodology. I hear you on that. The only problem with that is there's going to be a lot of lag. And then also you got to realize this might be a market at this particular time. This might be a market that, that really works well with your methodology, Phil, of, of that 50-day moving average system, okay? Because what has happened? The market kind of rolled over a little bit, especially NASDAQ, okay, especially the Russell but then what happened, especially NASDAQ, it's chopped around for a while. So you're kind of seeing this kind of play out in the individual issues that it's chopped around a little bit, maybe even worked its way higher a little bit, and then now you get the next leg lower. Okay, So that's what you're seeing in the overall. What you're seeing is a reflection of the overall market, and that's why that might be working at this particular juncture in time. And, and that waiting has kept you out of the whip, sorry, between. But keep in mind, a lot of times, you've got to take that first signal, okay? Because if you don't, you might miss it. Now, see, Phil uh, came on my service right around the time we did GME. And if you look at GME, GME set up right here, okay? And it began to sell off nicely, and this is where we got in. Well, Phil came into the service right around here, and he's like, well, wait a minute. Let me just wait for it to go back to the 50, and it will kiss that 50. And then Phil played it, and then, bam, it implodes. And nicely played. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. What you need to remember, though, is that they slide faster than they glide. And you're not going to always get that 50-day kiss like you did here, which turned, turned out to be an absolutely beautiful trade. Okay, Sometimes they're going to slide, and then they're going to slide. And those are your best, absolute best shorts. Okay? Keep in mind that it's been a function of the market lately, again, where I think that retrace of the 50 has really worked out nicely. Now, getting back to what Phil was saying, he says, okay, well, let's look at a weekly. Yeah, you can look at a weekly and trade by system. Absolutely, okay? Uh, this is especially true on the long side. So if you're looking at this, of course, it does look like just a little pullback. Um, I see what you're saying. The only problem is, by the time the chart turns on that weekly, as I just said, sometimes they slide and slide. Sometimes the market might be way down here. So be very careful, especially on the short side, waiting for a weekly signal. Okay, But I hear you. Okay, He's saying that on a weekly, you could trade weekly signals, which will look a lot like his pullback to the 50. HK for Mr. Jonathan, that sounds like Hong Kong. Halicon, 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 okay. Uh, that's an energy stock. It's kind of at these mid-levels in here, okay. Uh, you take a look at the longer-term ranges on this. It's kind of been all over the place. It's coming off of multi-year lows. I mean, I hear you. I just think there might be better off. There might be better stocks you can find. It's just got a lot of wide and loose trading, okay, uh, in it. That was on a weekly. Oh, let's get back to daily. Well, even on a daily. I don't know. It's kind of all over the place. It has worked its way higher. Maybe the problem is, see, you got this little drift right here. 
And then it kind of took off, and now it's kind of pulling back. So it has this drifting characteristic. The other thing that's kind of jumping out, I mean, this is something that we covered quite a bit in the stock webinar. Not to pimp that, but just to let you know the kind of things we talk about that, that, that might not be obvious right away. Notice that this market went kind of straight up, and then it kind of went like that, okay? So it's that, it's that deceleration and trend that you really have to pay attention to, and that's going to keep you out of a lot of bad positions, paying attention to deceleration of trend. As a general statement, you want a market to look like that and not like this right here. Okay. All right, GWPH. So avoid that one, I would think. GWPH. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a, it looks, this looks like the mother of all tops, but it's not really a pattern for me. It's kind of a, I guess it's kind of a weekly gatekeeper. Yeah, it's kind of a weekly, weekly gatekeeper pattern in here. Uh, sharp thrust down followed by a retrace, stalling short of the prior highs. That's what a gatekeeper is in a nutshell. Um, it's not for me, but I hear you. I think it's in a lot of trouble. Kind of has a head and shoulders top look to it. Okay. T net for win. Um, well, there's no structure here. Okay. Uh, there's two different hats I could put on. When I put on my IPO hat, one of the things that I have noticed with the IPOs is there is a breakout characteristic to them. So if you're going to trade breakouts, you're going to be much better off trading breakouts than something like IPOs. And, and there's a long there's a long line of reasoning that I have for that. Uh, they trade. Let me see if I can put it in a Reader's Digest. This is four hours worth of uh, work that I'm working on to present. But um, they trade in a more pure technical analysis fashion, meaning that they trade more purely on emotions, okay? So a breakout characteristic tends to work a little bit better in them or a lot better than anything else. But as far as a core methodology, I don't see anything there. Um, I would let it break out and look to play. And, and then even even with this issue here, I think I would let it break out and then look to pull back before trading it. But I hear you. It's not far from all-time closing highs, and that's a that's a decent pattern to look for in IPOs. Glog. That sounds like a shipping company. Yep, it is a shipping company. There's a there's a short. There's a potential short. Okay. I hate shipping companies. In case you didn't know that. Um, this one looks like it trends or can trends. I've been watching it. Can can trend, he tried to say. You got a thrust down followed by uh, if it closes above this low today, then yeah, that's a first thrust down. A little risky position, but um, I hear you're risky because transitional setups are a little bit more risky than others. But yeah, I think you're onto something there, Phil. Uh, and and you know what, those shippers are going to go down. If energies continue to sell off, those shippers are going to go are going to go down. Good morning, Don. Uh, LNG, LNG. Uh, no, it's too sideways. Let it break out and then look to play a pullback in here on that one. James wants to know about WPRT. WPRT sounds like an energy. Nope, it's not. Um, it's got one big update. I hate stocks that make this one and done type of move. So I would leave it alone based on that. Um, I hear you, though. I see what you're trying to say or I see what you're seeing. You're seeing like a transition from lows. Leave it alone. It looks like waiting for an entry is going to keep you out of that one anyway. I for Don. I. Never heard of it. Instat. Well, believe it or not, it's probably one of the best looking stocks Don's ever found. Still not a good looking stock, but. <laughs> it's like, uh, I always think about the joke about the guy that goes hunting in the, in the, in the, the bear has his way with him, and then the guy comes back two weeks later, and the bear has his way with him, and then he comes back two weeks later to go hunting, and the bear taps him on the shoulder and says, you're not really out here for the hunting, are you? <laughs> it's like it's like Don comes to these things to get beat up. So um, I hear you, man. It's, it's actually kind of bottomed out a little bit, but it's got a lot of overhead supply, so I would leave it alone. But it actually does look like it's bottomed out and pulled back a little bit. Um is Rice Gatekeeper looking? No, Rice is going to the moon. Um, I hear you. 
uh, well, it, it's, it hasn't taken out its prior highs yet. Uh, keep in mind that a gatekeeper, you want to see a really sharp sell-off and you want to see a really sharp retracement, okay? This is a pullback. So a pullback that begins to rally out of a pullback that doesn't make it quite to new highs is not a gatekeeper just yet, okay? And, and it's not the V part. The left side of the V is not enough to call that a gatekeeper. That's just a pullback, okay? That stock is still in an uptrend as far as I'm concerned, even though I am uh, a little biased on that one. Hey, Dave, when is a TKA too much of a pullback? Take a look at PES. It depends, okay? And the way you judge that, the easiest way to judge that, if I can get my chart back up, the easiest, get out of the way, Nicholas. The easiest way to judge that is, um, depends on the, on, the, on the acceleration of the market. If a market is going like straight up, you can have a pretty serious TKO. And that market could take off from there. TKO, to those of you who don't know, is is you have a big wide range bar down when you have a really good trend. I call it a trend knockout because it knocks out people in the trend. And the best thing to do to judge if this bar is big enough is you need to ask yourself what I've gotten knocked out of that position. So again, sharp trend, okay, to have a pretty serious knockout move. One of our big winners from not that long ago was CLDX, and I kind of beat this one to death. That was one where it was almost too extreme in the knockout move. But if you do get a bit of an extreme bar, let's say you get the bar looks like this, if it could come all the way back up and trigger, boy, then you've got something serious on your hand if you could make that big of a reversal. So in a case like CLDX, we said, all right, well, what the heck? Just for S and Gs, let's, let's go after it. If it can come all the way back, then we'll go after it. Okay, And it did really nicely. Now, let's take a look at the stock you're looking at. My problem with this stock is the first thing I see when I look at the stock is I see a bit of deceleration. Now, it might be a box stock, okay, but the stock tends to go sideways, it goes higher, and then it tends to go sideways. Well, now I'm seeing deceleration because, let's see, this stock has dropped. Now, I'm eyeballing this, but you could see, okay, okay. If you got to quantify, then quantify it. Stock has dropped. In a little bit less than a month, several weeks, it's dropped 3.3 percent. Okay, so it certainly hasn't gone anywhere. If you back this out a little further, so you got one month, more than one month, where it really hasn't done much. So this stock has lost momentum. I would not trade this stock. Now it might be a box stock, but you can see back here was a momentum stock, and now it's beginning to lose some of that steam. Um, it was kind of, you can see, again, kind of straight up here and then kind of like that, okay? So you definitely want to leave that one alone based on that. MTL. Uh, no, this is just sideways. You want to wait for it to break out before, before you do anything with that one. Don wants to know about L. What's, you just, he's just poking one finger at a time. <laughs> one letter stocks. No, <laughs> no, it's breaking down. Yeah, it might be a good short soon. LCI. Okay, and then we're going to have to go in lightning round quick. Uh, no, it's too many days in the pullback. I know what you're doing. I, this is a fill stock. This is fill stock. I know what he's doing. I better speed it up here. We're almost out of time. Yep, I see. I, I see what you're doing. And I think what you're doing might be working well because the the way the market is. Uh, longer term, I don't know if I would trade just that system in and of itself. I would look for something to get in a little bit earlier. But, hey, like I say, I'm often right, but um, early. Austin wants to know about Netflix and then Amazon also, NFLX. Uh, Netflix looks like it's at a downtrend to me, but it's been pretty choppy and sideways as of late. So I would leave it alone, but it does look like, it does look like a pretty big picture top. So if you're going to be doing anything with this stock, you want to be shortening it. But it's not set up, and it's been a little choppy as of late. Amazon's in a downtrend, too. Uh, Amazon, big, thick, 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 thick stock. Not a huge fan of trading Amazon. you got a mountain of supply. I'm sorry. Support down here around 250. So it's good for maybe 50 points. But I don't think I would trade it. I think I would find something a little bit thinner. 
uh, like we started the show with like the GTAT or something. If I was to look at the short something, PTX, PTX doc, you're next. Um, PTX is too much overhead supply. I think we talked about this one last week. Okay, I hear you. It's rallying up and all, but it's got too much overhead supply, so I would leave that one. Hey doc, how you been? I haven't seen you in a while. UGA, UGA. Uh, too sideways. Okay, it's a gasoline fund. Um, it's just wide and loose and too sideways. It's just electrocardiogram, so I would leave that one alone uh, for a long. Yeah, no, I'll leave that alone. Okay. Let's try to get somebody I haven't got to yet. PTX for Mr. Bill. Thanks for being patient, Bill. PTX. Yeah, we just looked at that one. Someone did. Somebody else asked about the same stock. Weird. Uh, WWAV, WWAV for Mr. Paul, and he wants to know if that's a viable pullback. Uh, maybe on a pullback, but the problem is you broke out past a prior peak in here, and now you've pulled back below it, okay? So for me to get excited about this stock, it would actually have to blast higher and then pull back. So wait for that to happen before looking to go after it. Ken wants to know about JEC, okay? Um, well, it's breaking down. There's nothing to do there now. Uh, maybe on pullbacks along the way, but it, yeah, it looks like it's broken. If that's what you're, you're asking, Steve wants to know about LXK. Yeah, that stock's in trouble. That's a uh, Lexmark. Um, my only problem with it is, and, and and again, this is where Phil's methodology comes into play. Um, it it it's probably yeah. Look at that. <laughs> there you go, Phil. There's your stock, Phil. Uh, my problem is it's too many days of the pullback. Usually, you want to see something crack. I want to see him crack and not look back. So you want to see this happen here. Uh, but now it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. It's got a month of trading sideways, so I would leave it alone. But I will admit this market, the frog market, the boiling the frog market that we've been seeing, the slowly raising of the temperature, that's what we're seeing lately is a market – where things are just kind of slowly coming unglued. So maybe this pullback to the 50 thing is working because this market is slowly coming unglued. Okay. All right. Uh, let's do one more and then let's uh, let's wrap it up. SHPG. SHPG. Um, I'm going to say no because it just barely got past this prior peak and now it's coming back in, in here. Uh, yeah, longer term trend, but... Look at that massive correction in between. It just looks kind of – I'm not a big fan of these cup and handle looking things at high levels. I like them at low levels, okay? I have to find other stocks as I am on your service and I have found all of your stocks. No disrespect to your methodology implied. Oh, okay. Well, good. Well, see, Phil, you're the, you're the ideal client because you're doing, you're doing your own homework and you're using me to find ancillary setups and you're using me to kind of carry the weight and – it might take you a few months, but you're gonna one day there's gonna be a stock that I find that you haven't already found, and that stock's gonna be the mother of all winners, and then that's when you're gonna say, Ah, that is worth its while. But it's good that you're doing your own homework because it helps to confirm what you're doing on your own. And that's awesome. And like I say, like I tell everybody, um, trade your own methodology and if, if you could take some of my stuff and make yours better or use me as part of your staff or take some ancillary things that I'm providing and use them and profit from them, then, hey, I'm, I'm flattered. That's all it uh, – I'm very happy. Look, we didn't get to everybody today. I apologize. I pontificated a little bit too long here. But anything unanswered, shoot me an email, daviddavelander.com, and I'll either do two things. One, I'll answer you directly if time allows. And if not, I will – which is likely. I'll probably find time to answer. But if not, we can make it fodder for next week's show. Uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk again, I am humbled by your presence. Thank you so much for coming to the shows. I appreciate it. You have no idea how much this means to me that you're here. So thank you so much. I'm humbled that you guys will come listen to me speak every week. Um, again, everybody enjoy the weekend if we don't talk again. And uh, I guess I'll see you guys and girls next week. Thank you so much.